Once again, a child has been caught in the crossfire. So often have we seen this image in recent years that some worry the death of a child in the poorest parts of this city has lost its power to move us, that the senselessness and waste may no longer register with us as it once might have. It's always someone innocent that gets, you know, killed uh, in this matter. <laughs> it's my first born and I love him. I miss him so, so much. AJ was his name. Arthur Lee Williams Jr. was 13, funny and friendly. He was not a gangbanger. He was an ordinary kid who made the fatal mistake of opening the door of his mother's CHA apartment and walking outside. Arthur Lee Williams Jr. died for absolutely no reason at all. What happened to him should happen in nobody's neighborhood. In nobody's neighborhood. Reported by Carol Marine. Crime is everywhere and it affects everybody's neighborhood. But the kind and the amount of crime that occurs here at the CHA is beyond what anyone anywhere would consider acceptable. And that violence touches all of our lives no matter where we live not just in the young people who are lost, but in the millions and millions of dollars, tax dollars that are spent every year for what is in large part a losing battle. Kevin Say and David Davis are soldiers in the war. They're police officers for the Chicago Housing Authority. Their place of employment, the projects, public housing, the CHA, say the names out loud and many of us see in our mind's eye a place we have never been. Public housing in Chicago is isolated and segregated. It is set apart from the rest of the city and surrounding suburbs. In many ways the CHA is regarded as an island of uncommonly high crime. It is a dangerous place to live and a dangerous place to work. They're having a little uh, gathering. This is a gang gathering over here? Right. How can you tell? I can tell when they all assemble. 64,000 people live in the projects where CHA police, like Say and Davis, patrol. It is an unpredictable population where a minority of residents wreak havoc on those just trying to survive. Those people include Beverly Hill. It's a lot of violence, a lot of games around here. There are uh, cheaties and beaties, you know. So if you could change one thing here at CHA, it would be? The gangs. But it's games everywhere you go now, you know. A few blocks away in a Stateway Gardens apartment building, officers Say and Davis go about their daily rounds checking abandoned apartments. As the officers check inside, a group of men gather outside. Officer Davis, these people all out on the hoods of the cars and in the parking lot, those are gang leaders? Yes, they are. Uh, they, they have lookouts up in uh, the highest points of the building to see us when we come. They usually, uh, they do a series of whistles or scream out 5-0 or robo. And what do they call you again? Robos. Like Robocop? Exactly, or 5-0. Like Hawaii 5-0. Exactly. Remember this man in the yellow jacket. With officers Say and Davis, we head south to the Robert Taylor Homes to answer a routine call about an electrical problem in one of the buildings. But the quiet of this afternoon is quickly broken as a call goes out that shots have been fired somewhere else. The Dan Ryan Expressway provides a fast route north from the Taylor Homes back to Stateway Gardens where we just were and where a shooting has just occurred. On the ground is the man in the yellow jacket. Okay, could you please back off, sir? His name is Alan Kindred. He's ble bleeding from the throat. He's, he's shot in the throat. It's a bad wound. 
The shooting was sparked by an argument following a traffic accident. It is one example of just how fast things can change at the CHA. We were just here how many minutes ago? About 15 minutes ago. About five minutes about ago. Five minutes ago. About five minutes ago. But within the space of a few minutes, it can go from peaceful to wide open. Exactly. Kindred survived to become a CHA crime statistic, an illustration of just how fragile life can be and how fleeting is the peace of any given moment in the Chicago Housing Authority. 24. Well, we are always on the guard against anything that might happen. So, whether it's night or day, we always on, on the guard. On guard because violence gives no notice here at the CHA, and so residents are on a 24-hour alert. They have no other choice. We can't live in fear all of our life. This is a place where we have to stay, we have to raise our children. Lily Webb is one of 900 residents who belong to the tenant patrol. If I have to die for a cause, I will die for a cause. I'm not afraid of no one. But hidden by the night and sheltered by the buildings at the CHA, even the fearless lack the opportunity to confront their enemy. The violence can be everywhere and still unseen. It should be at 4410. Officer Davis gets the first word. They're shooting at 4410, a disciple building on South State. Uh, 10 4 sir, we responded to a uh, shot fired at 44 10th State. The officers turn off the car lights and drive up on the concrete sidewalks in order to avoid becoming a target themselves. Uh, that was uh, shot fired over by 44, 44 State, 44, 44 State. Officers Say and Davis are now told the building across from 4410 has shooting as well. There is a gang war going on between these two buildings. What you are about to see next is all too routine for officers Say and Davis. Officer Davis leaves the car first. Let me get out. 10 4. Moments later, we follow. As shots ring out, we head for the building. Once inside, the object is to find the shooter. It's a nearly impossible and extraordinarily dangerous task. The chase takes us to the fifth floor, and once again, a shot is fired. Sergeant Willie Miranda joins Say and Davis in the search, checking hallways and vacant apartments. We're on the sick, we're coming down. Stick close with us, I don't want you guys to take it. I'm coming down the sixth floor, west entrance. Okay, okay, come on down, come on down. All right. After six minutes, the search proves futile, and the circumstance within the building is deemed too dangerous to search further. Coming out now. Walk, walk next to us. Coming out of the building now. Get out of here. Get in the car. Get out of here. I'll cover. I'm 
Yeah. Yeah. Blue Street. Sorry, the way out of here. Back inside their squad car, Say and Davis explain why this building, 4410, is considered so dangerous. Uh, there were shots fired, I believe it was on the fifth floor, which is the building that we were at. They, uh, they said they saw shots coming from the fifth floor and uh, several male blacks running from that location. Tax Sergeant said it's a bad building. Oh, yeah, it's a terrible building. Why? Uh, that's where the, uh, the uh, once again, uh, it's a lot of corporate game bangers, older game bangers, like 4331, yeah. 4352, the, these, these, 4410. These buildings down here have a history of shooting. Okay? And these are older men who are serious businessmen about the drug business? That's right. true. And that's what you mean by a corporate gang banger, right. is that right? That's true. The events of this night that took us to the fifth floor of the 4410 building took place this past April. It would be just two and a half months later that same building, same floor, 13-year-old Arthur Lee Williams Jr. would die because once again, somebody somewhere in here was shooting. I was just saying, AJ, stay in the house, you know, because they've been shooting around here. They had been shooting since early, way early, like six something in the morning. You would just hear it, I mean, high-powered guns. And I was just saying, you know, I guess they'll stop the shooting once someone get killed. And I had no idea that it would be my son. The tree-lined Lincoln Park neighborhood in Chicago with its old brick and new buildings. The northwest suburb of Schaumburg with its houses and condos and well-cared-for lawns. Each community is the same size as the area patrolled by the CHA police, but the quality of life and the quantity of crime are radically different. If you took this, the same amount of crime and put it in another community of the same size, it would be an outrage. Hosea Crosley is the chief of the CHA police force. More than that, he is himself a child of the CHA, raised in the Ida B. Wells homes in the 1950s. It was a different kind of life then. When I grew up in public housing, most of the families had a father at home. You know, most of the parents, uh, they were working families, they were on welfare. So it's a completely different type of atmosphere. We were responsible for cleaning up our own areas. And that's something that doesn't happen now. But in the last three decades, the policy governing public housing changed. In the late 50s, when they, uh, the uh, aid to dependent children came about, and the only way you get it if there was no father in the home. And it drove the men away. It drove the men out. I mean, if you don't have a job and you can't support your family, the only way they can get food is for you to be out of the home, then you have to leave. Vince Lane is the chairman of the Chicago Housing Authority. Public policy has fostered a sense of dependency for the last three generations. So you've got young people today who watch their mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers waiting for a welfare check waiting for the system to get them up in the morning, feed them, bus them somewhere, bring them back home, tuck them in bed at night, and start all over again the next day. You could be a polka dot zebra, and you'd turn out the same way if you were confronted with that kind of environment. Today, half of all of the people who live in the CHA, half are children. Virtually all of those children are under the age of 15. And three out of every four households are headed by a single mother. Most who live here, according to Chief Crosley, want only to live in a safe neighborhood. I'd say 90% are decent law-abiding citizens. And it's this, the, 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 that, that other 10% that's causing all those problems. It is the gangs and the guns and the drugs that hold the balance of power here. I think for most people who pick up bites on the television and headlines in the newspaper, they can't even begin to imagine you may be assaulted, uh, uh, you may be robbed, you may get to your apartment and it's burglarized, and that threat is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week in public housing. And that's why I think it's a, it's a national disgrace. Uh, that we have permitted uh, people to live in this kind of environment. In an effort to better understand the kinds of crime that occur here, Channel 5 News examined and cataloged police reports for the month of February 1993. 
in that one short cold month in the CHA, we found at least 719 cases of violence, vice, and property crime. Among them, two homicides, five criminal sexual assaults, 36 assaults, 203 batteries, 55 thefts, 95 crimes of criminal damage to property, 35 robberies, 50 burglaries, and 135 drug crimes. Though it's easy to assume that most CHA crime is gang-related, that's really only part of the story. According to the crime reports we studied, it is also crimes committed by husbands against wives, boyfriends against girlfriends, brothers against brothers, mothers against daughters. Case in point, a girlfriend and boyfriend in a domestic with a knife. Or a man robbed by his sister and brother-in-law or the three children abandoned by their mother in a roach-infested house with drug paraphernalia. The weapons that get the most attention are the guns. But it's not just guns that inflict damage here. According to police reports, a weapon can be anything, including a rake, a rock, a hairbrush, a pickle jar, a hammer, an ax, a doorknob, even a high heel shoe. If gang violence is a threat here, so too is domestic violence. And residents, it's argued, have to take responsibility. Uh, they're going to have to participate. And they're going to have to acknowledge people in their families have substance abuse problems. Uh, uh, they have uh, uh, gang affili affiliations. And, uh, uh, and they have illegal weapons. And they're going to have to acknowledge that. And we're going to have to try to put resources in there to get at the root causes for, for that kind of behavior. Beverly Hill has lived in the CHA since she was nine. She's raised four children here. Is there any solution to all of this as far as you're concerned? No, you know, it's up to the parents to try to do something with their kids. But some of the parents, even if they're working hard at home with their kids, face the fear of what they can't control outside in the form of gangs and drug dealers who make money here. In the meantime, it has cost money, a lot of money, to try and put a lid on the crime and violence in the CHA. Five years ago, the taxpayer price tag for law enforcement here was $5 million. Today, it's 65 to $68 million. CHA Chairman Vince Lane. Doesn't it's crazy. It's insanity. I mean, I could take $65 million and support a $700 million bond issue where we could build the housing to uh, replace Cabrini. So with that money that you spend on police, there are many other better alternatives for you. Many better alternatives. Lane has argued here and in Washington that the CHA is everyone's problem. And until those who live within its bounds and those who live outside join together in pursuit of some coherent public housing policy, then little, if anything, will change. And until the problem is staring, Joe Q. America in his face when he opens the door in the morning and there it is on his lawn, we won't solve the problem. Everybody has to realize it is a problem for all of us, not just CHA. these gangs understand the consequence of what they do? I think they understand, but um, it's like anything, you know, it may die down now, but who's not to say that someone else will be sitting in my same seat one day with their child, standing in the wrong place at the wrong time. When Lenise Butler buried her son AJ this July, she made plans to move out of the CHA. Ironically, Lenise Butler is exactly the kind of person Vince Lane wishes would stay. Someone who holds a responsible job, as she does at the Harris Bank in Chicago. Someone who does all she can to protect her children. Vince Lane believes if the CHA is ever to become a sane and safe place for residents like Lenise Butler and her remaining children, 
low rises need to replace the high and more working families need to join the population. Low rise developments like Ida B. Wells, for instance, where residents have risen up to take charge, offer some hope that things can improve. Federal Housing Secretary Henry Cisneros toured public housing in Chicago not long ago with the promise of $50 million from Washington to fund CHA redevelopment. The money has not yet arrived. If there is no simple, single solution to the violence at the CHA, there are at the very least two indisputable facts on which to fix our attention. The first could be called the human argument. It is that as long as the violence continues, young lives will continue to be lost or damaged in this environment. The other is a consumer argument, that as long as the violence exists, every one of us in every single neighborhood will pay for the law enforcement it takes to meet the problem. And the cost of that law enforcement hasn't just doubled or tripled in the last five years, it's gone up 14 times. And though it's true that the overall crime rate here has declined, the amount of crime that still exists here at the CHA is so great that it would be judged unacceptable by anybody anywhere. What happens here at the CHA should happen in nobody's neighborhood. To the light, master, take my hand. Precious.